Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, China, an economic miracle built on exports. So where does it turn when that starts to falter? The National People's Congress gives us a hint at the future. Also, the top job at the World Bank. This man, Jeffrey Sachs, reckons it should be his. And strong at home but weak in Europe, we put GM's deal with Peugeot under the spotlight at the Geneva Auto Show. So just how do you tell the China story, given its size, its population, its influence, the contradictions between its domestic and international personas? Is there a way to define this economic behemoth? Probably not. Well, not without doing justice to China's diversity anyway. However, when the National People's Congress meets once a year, it does give us the big picture, at least of where the government sees China. The top line in what was Premier Wen Jiabao's last Congress before stepping down was that China's growth target was being revised down to 7.5%. It has been at 8% or above uh, since 2004. And China needs to maintain around 8% growth just to keep up with the influx of new workers. Wen also acknowledged China does need to start shifting away from exports to the West and look more at domestic consumption. That is welcome news for global partners who complain about the unfair advantages that China apparently has. Here's the domestic situation though and why it is problematic. Chinese are great at saving, but that means only 37% of what they make is actually going back into the economy. They're saving the rest. Now in emerging markets, they're spending more like 50%. So to stimulate the economy, people have got to start splashing the cash. And one way to do that, and this is being talked about, is to provide a safety net. We're talking things like pensions and health care and transfers to the very poor. That is going to be a massive undertaking for a population of well over a billion people. But remember, the money is there. That export economy has created a foreign currency surplus of more than $3 trillion. And to give you an idea of what that means, that sort of cash could buy China the combined sovereign debt of Portugal, Ireland, Greece and Spain. Still enough change left over to snap up Apple, Microsoft, Google and IBM. Well, let's introduce our feature guest for this week, Chandra Nair from the Global Institute for Tomorrow, a think tank which focuses on pan-Asian issues. Good to have you with us on Counting the Cost, Chandra. Let's talk about what uh, Premier Wen Jiabao uh, came up with at the uh, Communist Party Congress. 7.5% growth target, which, yes, is a bit lower, certainly the lowest we've had in, in quite a few years. But more important, that acknowledgement that China's got to turn away from this export model and got to become more domestic. How do you turn around a huge export ship like that, or at least start to turn it around? Well, I think, you know, I, I'm no expert on how to run the Chinese economy, but uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. I think it also reflects some of the deep thinking that's going on in China about uh, weaning itself away from the export-led market, which creates all these global imbalances and then the geopolitical tensions that come with it. How China does it, perhaps uh, it has a better chance than most in terms of being able to do that because of the way the government operates and it's a state-run economy to some ex extent, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing in my mind anyway. Well, what about the idea of, of, and this will be central I think, encouraging spending at home, getting the domestic economy moving, and this idea of a sort of welfare state, you, you make people feel more secure about their future with a pension and things like that, so that they're actually putting their money today into the economy rather than saving it for later? Well, you know, uh, time will tell. I mean, the scale of this sort of transformation is not something that we've witnessed before. So China is essentially experimenting with uh, a completely new dimension in terms of what in the direction of its own economy and the global economy. So it's challenging much of the conventional wisdom of the last, you know, 30, 40 years. I mean, in terms of my simple argument, and which has had some traction here, is that firstly China and the rest of Asia should not adopt the, the sort of consumption-led economic model that we have adopted for the last three, four decades from, from the West. I think the time is up for that, principally because I believe that uh, a world in which um, five to six billion Asians in 2050 are consuming like the average American or European is not one that can be sustained. And I think the Chinese are acutely aware of this but I suspect that there is an ideological battle internally as to how this uh, realization will then be reflected in new policies and the transformation of, you know, a country with 1.2 to 1.3 billion people. What about maintaining those big state-owned enterprises that you mentioned before, that state economy? Again, would, would, is, that, is that viable? 
I think we've seen uh, in the last 30 years especially the Chinese have dismantled some of the larger state-owned uh, enterprises uh, for which there have been certain consequences as well. Now, will the Chinese be able to find a balance between having some element of free markets and at the same time uh, providing the safety nets through the SOEs? Uh, time will tell, but there is no doubt in my mind that um, this is an issue that they will have to calibrate very, very carefully. But I come back to the, you know, the, the argument that I talked about and that appeared in my FT article, uh, I think a couple of days ago, that China, India, the rest of Asia have to completely rethink the consumption-led economic model, mainly because I think most of us are in denial about this assumption that all of us can live some kind of Western dream. This yeah. is simply not possible. The, all the science is clear, the evidence is clear, yet the, the economic model seems to have become some sort of uh, orthodoxy, some kind of religion, and no one dares sort of challenge it because it's almost a taboo subject, and we will have to wake up from this denial. What about China's money? Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the foreign currency reserves, the much vaunted three trillion that it's got sitting there. What, what, what does it do with that, in your opinion? What, what, how is it best served putting that foreign currency to work? You know, I'm not an economist, and uh, I don't mean that as an apology, but <laughs> I think this is a question that uh, many in the developed world have wondered. How is it that you know U.S. Treasury bonds, etc., are sustained? by the fact that hard-working Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, etc., have to put their money in it. I mean, this is the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, as we all know. And I would suspect that uh, the Chinese, like others, must be waiting for the time to figure out how this can be configured very differently, and therefore to answer your question, how their money can be put to good use, rather than propping up uh, a global currency reserve that uh, is at huge risk depending mm. on how the U.S. economy and, and uh, the global sort of speculation, speculative efforts of investment banks, etc., play around with that. Well, this is kind of the thing that China is... It's one of those sort of catch-22s. Whatever it does, someone's going to criticise. If it sits on its money, people are saying you're not doing anything with it, you could be helping out Europe or something like that. If they do something with it, they'll be accused of trying to take over the world, investing too much in Africa and all these things. You know, how, how does China in the end engage economically with an international community, which probably regards it still with some level of suspicion? Well, yes, this is, this is such a common thing that uh, you see in the international media all the time that... Uh, you know, nine out of ten pieces of news about China is essentially negative. Mm. Uh, I think this is almost uh, xenophobic in the way it's presented, particularly in the USA at the moment. And it's very unfortunate. If you watch the Chinese news media and if you are in China, whilst the Chinese will ex accept that they have many struggles to, to deal with and they have many shortcomings too, I think they're given very, very little credit and, uh, you know, only time will tell at what point the Chinese start to ignore this criticism and just go their own way. I think at, this, at the moment, my sense is uh, that the Chinese are very keen to be global players, but I think in the sort of chattering classes that you, you know, get their voices heard in the international media, there's such fear of China. Part of it is essentially also not coming to terms that the world has changed. So those who've been accustomed to a world order in which they sit at the top are suddenly having to come to uh, recognize that the world is changing. And it must be very difficult for people to accept a nation which does not follow the orthodoxy of the sort of Western view of the world, which is somehow free markets, technology, capitalism, and democracy sit very comfortably and as solutions to all of humanity's problems. China is rewriting the, book, the rule, rewriting the rule book on this, and this must create great discomfort. So I do hope that, uh, as has been stated by many other commentators from Asia, uh, the Western world, particularly the U.S., will see China as a partner, move beyond the rhetoric, and understand that the solutions the Chinese will find are very different. It will be very much up to them, and we will have to support them in, in the pursuit of those very tricky um, solutions. Chandra Nair, very, very interesting talking to you. Thank you for joining us on Counting the Cost. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, India's energy dependency. But how can New Delhi get around the sanctions on Iran? There is a pretty unique solution. We'll tell you about a little later on. 
Right now, though, the leadership of the World Bank. Now, you'll remember there's a bit of an unwritten rule about this. It goes back to Bretton Woods in 1944, the conference which essentially designed uh, the economic bodies and systems we have in place today. It was decided then an American would be the World Bank president and a European would be the head of the IMF. Done deal. So, with Robert Zellick's five-year term as president ending in mid-2012, we're starting to think about possible successes. There is definitely a movement arguing for a break with the American tradition. China, for example, explicitly calling for an open selection process based wholly on merit. So far, though, the most prominent person to put their name forward is an American, development economist Jeffrey Sachs, who spoke to our business editor Abid Ali about his candidacy, the US economy and China's global role. Well, I think that there's one thing going on, which is if you're appointing people because they're bankers or they're politicians, then people are saying, well, if it's just bankers or politicians, why not our bankers and our politicians? And since it's been 11 American presidents in a row, uh, it's pretty natural sentiment with the rising powers to say it's our turn. I think that the World Bank position should be viewed as a professional position based on knowledge, capacity, how to get things done. Of course, I welcome an open process in that regard. I put myself forward as someone who has a worldwide proven track record, I've worked in more than 100 countries around the world. I'm known by world leaders. I have real results, which I'm very proud of. Of course, if we're going to operate at the level of amateurs and politicians, then there's absolutely no case, it seems to me, for one country, even the United States, to say that's ours. Or I shouldn't say even, just any country to say that's ours. But if we're going to operate at the level of professionalism, it's not a matter of nationality, then it's a matter of somebody's record and capacity. What has the World Bank done wrong? I think the World Bank has made many, many mistakes over the years. Uh, it's been led essentially by Wall Street and by bankers and by politicians. It has not been led by development experts. This has caused it to make some truly consequential blunders of huge proportion. In the 1980s, uh, the World Bank really abandoned small farmers who are the peasant farmers who constitute so many of the world's poor. Uh, it led to terrible consequences for 20 years delaying the onset of economic development in large parts of Africa, for example. The bank completely blundered uh, in its uh, treatment of uh, health policy throughout the 1990s, even as the AIDS pandemic was raging. Didn't know how to react. It was using very bad concepts of cost recovery uh, or uh, fee-for-service ideas uh, that uh, were inapplicable for poor countries. So when the bank gets things wrong, it really costs. Uh, it costs the lives of poor people. It certainly costs a lot of delay. And I don't think we have the luxury to have the bank continue to get things wrong. China's actually said it would like to rebalance its economy. How does it go about doing that? It's saying it wants to spend more on welfare. I think the first thing to say about China is that as their export growth to the U.S. and Europe slow down, it doesn't mean that they have to balance that only by increased consumption domestically. That's an idea that's propounded by many American economists, but it's not right. Uh, it's much too simplistic. One way for China to rebalance, as it were, would be to export more to Africa. Which exports? Exports of the infrastructure that Africa needs. So if China used its savings to help finance a lot of infrastructure building in Africa or in Cambodia or Laos or other parts of Asia where there are huge infrastructure needs, this would be good for the Chinese economy and good for the partner countries. China can also rebalance not by shifting from exports to consumption, but by maintaining good and even increased investments domestically in critical areas. China has a lot of pollution, for example. The air and the water is highly polluted. China should use this decade to really clean up the natural environment because it's doing a lot of damage to the health of the Chinese people. And I think that this is recognized. So there's a lot of domestic investment that can be made. I just want to get your views on the United States economy. Where is it on the path to recovery? The U.S. is uh, on uh, a recovery. It's not 
a robust recovery. It's probably good enough to keep the U.S. from a second dip, uh, and uh, the job situation is improving. That's having its effect on improving consumer confidence and spending. But it's not a robust recovery where one feels a boom is underway. There still is a lot of overhang of debt. There's a lot of overhang of the housing bubble that remains. And there's a very deep structural problem in the U.S., which is that a lot of kids are not getting the job skills they need to be competitive at middle class earnings uh, in the U.S. In other words, they're facing a lot of competition from abroad in a global labor market right now. That's why one could say that there may be some cyclical recovery, but this huge inequality of income that the United States has, the fact that so many of the gains of income are going to the very top of the income distribution has not been solved uh, because that requires a structural change, a change of government policies, and I'm afraid that we're not yet on that uh, path uh, that's solving the structural problems. We've discussed sanctions on Iran many times on this program, but not so much on how it affects other countries. India is in fact a great example, one of the largest importers of Iranian oil, but both the US and the EU are pushing them to cut those imports. How do you get around that? Have a look at this now from Pranasuri. This is how India is planning to pay Iran for its oil. Rice and grains from across the country come to this market in New Delhi. From here, they'll be shipped to other Indian ports to be finally sold in Iran. It's a novel way to bypass recent economic sanctions imposed by the United States and the European Union on Tehran. India and Iran have come up with a unique barter trade agreement. Under that, Iranian oil will be paid in the Indian rupee. It's a currency that isn't freely tradable. So the way the Iranians are going to dispose of their rupees is by buying goods like this, making it an extremely lucrative arrangement for the Indians. New Delhi is Tehran's second largest oil customer after China. India buys over $12 billion worth of crude oil. And that provides energy to over 400 million Indians who don't have access to commercial energy. But in the last few months, the United States has pressured India to cut back on its oil imports from Iran. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, testifying at a congressional meeting last month, said the United States is having, quote, very intense and very blunt, unquote, conversations with India, China and Turkey on reducing their dependence on Iranian oil. In exchange, the Americans are offering oil from Saudi Arabia as a substitute. But India has so far refused. In a strongly worded statement last week, the Indian embassy in Washington said, An automatic replacement of all Iranian oil imports is not a simple matter of selection or a realistic option. A sentiment which resonates back home. We are not going to take sides. Taking sides for us is not an option. And also this idea that uh, you are either you are with us or against us is really not acceptable and is something we must resist and in fact reject. And while there's no simple solution to this complex problem, the main players who are winning in this diplomatic game are for now these businessmen. Now, it was the Geneva Motor Show this week, one of Europe's big automotive showcases, though not the most ideal of economic environments to be holding it in. Case in point, General Motors, which has rebounded from the dark days of 2009 uh, to actually retake the title of world's largest automaker. However, its European division can't point to such levels of success. Even though it took an award for European Car of the Year, Opel, which is GM's European brand, has been losing money for years and its market share is pretty weak. So in an effort to turn things around, GM announced it's taking a 7% stake in Peugeot Citroën in an effort to trim costs and co-develop new vehicles. Will it work? Let's ask the man at the top, Carl Friedrich Strack, who is the president of GM Europe, joining us from the Geneva Motor Show. Thank you for your time, Mr. Strack. Tell me about this uh, new partnership. What are you going to get out of it? Yeah, before I come to this, let me briefly say that we are very, very proud of um, getting the Car of the Year award for our uh, uh, Ampera, which is obviously uh, our uh, electrified vehicle. So we are leading basically with this Car of the Year award, also the electromobility segment, and we are very proud of this, and all of our employees in the company want to thank for this. But now coming to your 
question. Also, the PSA uh, alliance is a very important uh, alliance for us going forward, as we are going to share uh, on the sourcing side uh, basically our our footprint, and we are going also to improve our logistics as such uh, as we work together. Very important, so is that we are working on the architectures together, the components and the design of, of the cars in, in this regard, and we are looking for the right technologies developments to do this together in the future to really minimize structure cost uh, and improve the outcome out of our R&D activities to really allow the company and Opel Vauxhall to have more products on the road in a faster time, because that's what it what matters. And then how does, well not so much how does Opel fit into this, but how does this fit into the Opel story? Because Opel is your European brand, which hasn't been doing so well. Therefore, how do these two things, the two, the acquisition and Opel, sort of mesh together? I think it's a very important alliance in this regard to lower structure costs that we can really work on the distribution channel and basically work on basically selling more cars and having more product portfolio available for us going forward. And I think that's a huge, unique opportunity as, as we share all of all of those synergies. And with this, I think we expected a significant shave, a saving in the, in the years to come. Uh, and I think uh, there's even more opportunity uh, you know, in this alliance, if, if if you really do it in a successful way, and have no no doubt that we will handle it in a in a very professional way down the road. And you think it'll mean you'll be actually holding on to staff instead of cutting them, as you and, and so many other auto companies have had to do for the last few years. The alliance is not meant to be to resolve uh, individuals' problems uh, on, on both ends. It's really meant to be to share costs and to share developments in the future. So everybody needs to do their homework in order to look for sustainable profitability of their company. Uh, and that's exactly what we embrace to do. We have started the, on a journey to really look for sustainable profitability in Europe. And so we're involving and engaging every stakeholder right now to get this done. With all aggressiveness and, 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 and on a very short time frame. I saw a comment from uh, the former boss of Magna actually which bid for Opel back in 2010. Uh, he reckons GM actually made a mistake by holding on to it. Are you, are you confident long term this will work for the company? I am 100% convinced that this is a long-term right direction. Uh, we have seen here now the corporate, uh, the corporation have my, uh, made a great choice uh, in using the PSA as a partner uh, for both. The corporation will benefit from this, but also Opel Vauxhall here in the very tough European environment will benefit from this as well. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the tough European environment because I did want to ask you about that and, and how it plays into uh, the wider GM company. You know, GM. You'll know this, of course, once again, the world's biggest automaker, but there is no denying that lag in Europe. Do you feel the pressure on you internally to, to up your game? Yeah, as I said earlier, I think it's a clear commitment uh, of the board and, uh, and the whole team here in Europe to really make a change. Uh, where our uh, our goal is uh, to retain uh, sustainable profitability in, in a very aggressive way, in a short way. And I think we have taken all types of action internally in the company to really get this accomplished and achieved. And actually, I'm very, I'm, I'm very uh, basic confident that we will achieve that. And uh, even so, uh, that the market is not in, in any support right now, mainly the, in the European, the southern European area. All right, could I get, just to finish off, your, your wider views on what's happening in Europe at the moment? I feel we've all been focusing so much uh, on Greece and debt more recently. The problems are very much continent-wide, though. Where do you think Europe is at right now with regards to things like business confidence, employment, those sorts of issues? The markets are still very volatile and uh, mainly the, the southern cluster is and so uh, we hope that we have seen the bottom uh, the bottom here and that we hopefully then see also the market picking up, picking up in the second half. At least that's the best of the prediction of every, let's say, forecasting measure we know that the markets will slightly picking up in the second half of this year. Carl Friedrich Strack, the president of GM Europe, joining us this week on Counting the Cost. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. And that is where we'll leave you for this week. But if you want to get in touch with the show, there are three easy ways to do it. Twitter, first of all, you can send a tweet to me at Kamal AJE or our business editor, who you saw in the show today, at Abid Oliver Ali. If you're not on Twitter, email's just fine. Counting the cost at altazira.net. And while you're online, you can go to altazira.com slash business 
you link onto the CTC page from the top, we put all our episodes up there in full for you to catch up on whenever you want. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Thank you.